So um, let me give an official welcome to this session uh, where we're going to be talking about building successful online events. Obviously, over the past year, um, online events have really taken off. Um, we've been doing it for um, a little longer than that, but uh, we've got a lot of experience from the last 18 months, year in particular. Um, and we're going to just go through that and also hear from your experiences, which is obviously crucial to uh, this sort of peer to peer training session or learning event at CBA 15. Um, I just want to introduce myself. My name's Matt Wright. I work for the International Institute for Environment De and Development and manage lots of the digital projects here at the Institute. Um, assisting me um, is Teresa Soroka, um, who you may well know um, as she is one of the key organisers of CBA 15. Uh, she's also a project manager in our climate change research group. Um, and also assisting is Georgina Diaz, who works with me at IIED, and she'll be sort of handling lots of the technical aspects. Um, we're going to start with um, some housekeeping, um, and I want to make clear that we're recording this meeting, um, so do bear that in mind. Um, you've probably seen a lot of this before already at CBA 15 sessions and, and other digital events. Um, Whilst this is important, I'm also going to take the opportunity to talk about why it's important, if that makes sense, um, because it can be it can be easy to dismiss. You know, this is just the uh, the standard stuff you go through at the start of an online session. Um, but there's a reason that there is always the standard stuff at the start of an online session, and that's because it's really important um, to take the security precautions notice, for example. So we've um, we've taken various precautions. Um, and we urge people not to uh, share the link on social media. And the reason for that is because people can join the session if you, make, if you give them the opportunity and disrupt it and interrupt it. And that's a real risk for your, for your organization. Um, if you're live streaming events, you know, the, the, these things can go out to lots of people. They can take on a life of their own um, and be quite damaging. So that security aspect is really vital. Um, you can control in-person events when you can see people um, a lot more easily. Um, so you have to really be sure that you've got everything tied down uh, from this perspective. The connection issue at the bottom there um, is also vital. So, you know, the biggest problem in, in these online events, um, undoubtedly, is the quality of the Internet connection. Um, and this will come up a lot today in this session, I'm sure. So the key is, you know, to encourage people as much as possible to close sort of anything they don't need um, so they can run the, the meeting as well as possible and as quickly as possible. We're going to, microphones are muted, but we'll be having breakout sessions later when you'll be able to um, speak and share experiences. Please contribute comments and questions via the chat box throughout. Um, be great to see what's going on, what, what views you have throughout, throughout the entire session, and we'll certainly be considering those at the end in the Q&A. Um, do share your webcam, be great to see you, actually see you if you can, but bear in mind that that takes uh, extra bandwidth, so if there are any issues, uh, do turn your video off. In case you haven't done before, the participants box opens a panel on the right where you can see everyone else um, and interact with us all, and also the chat icon next to it, these are all at the bottom of your screen where you can download, open up a box where you can enter comments and questions. Alternatively, you can request technical support. Georgina's on hand and we will prioritise any issues that you have. And finally, we've disabled the screen sharing um, and recording options for participants. Uh, sorry, not finally, there's one more, I beg your pardon, and that's that you can um, use the reactions to share immediate feedback as well. So tell us what you're liking, what you dislike, what you agree with uh, that way if you want. I mentioned this earlier, but to those who've just arrived, um, do update your name and let us know who you are in your organization. You can go to the more and rename um, in the participants, over, hover above your name, you'll find that. That helps us just keep track of who's who and makes everything a little bit more personal. And then here's another nice shot of Teresa that uh, we, we had in our template file. If you want to hide non-video participants, uh, you can do so. And so you can see more of who is in the call. The chat box is particularly important because we do want people to interact and engage with the session. And, you know, we want to engage with people. We want to know what people are thinking and their views. Um, and we'll get to as many comments uh, and so on as we can throughout this entire session. 
that's the intro section and why that intro section is important because people can only uh, engage and interact if they understand how to do so obviously um, we're now going to go into a couple of quick polls the first one is really we really want to get a sense of how how many sort of of these online events people have participated in or even engaged in um, so now you can see on the screen, there's two polls there. The first one is sort of looking at uh, trying to gauge experience um, and sort of work out where we're coming from as we, as we, as we run this session. Um, no surprise to see that uh, people are, the, the, first, the first answer is lots, just because, you know, that's the way things are going at the moment, isn't it? And then of, in the second question, keen to sort of explore what people find the most valuable things from an online meeting that, they've, that they want as a participant. You know, is it hearing from experts? Is it the opportunity to ask questions themselves? Is it the, the opportunity to actually speak? Um, there's a difference between writing in a chat box and actually having, you know, having the ability to, uh, to contribute verbally uh, and having that direct engagement. And then there's the interaction engagement with, with the panel and other participants, direct discussion among smaller groups. So that's more the, the breakout room side of things, contacts, networking, uh, security aspect that we talked about. And then the final one um, is sort of, you know, how important is it to be able to access recordings of events afterwards? That's particularly useful when you, know, you can't attend the online event. Um, typically, organizers will send around the recording afterwards. So if something comes up, then that doesn't matter so much. OK, sort of as expected, people are you know, regularly or attending these events. Um, no, no one's new, uh, which is great. We can uh, skip over some of the sort of the more basic elements as we go on in the session. And then I don't think it's a surprise that actually engage the, the interaction engagement has come up as key um, in the answers there. The, the, Whilst hearing from experts and so on is, is the joint top there, it's the, it's the interaction engagement that, um, that, that features strongly. So it's, it's actually being able to direct questions that you care about to, to the panel, to talk to other participants um, and so on. That's really useful. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to go on now to the types of events um, that we're going to be looking at. So obviously with the COVID-19 pandemic um, and particularly sort of the inability to travel and meet up in per person there's been a real seismic shift in mindset mainly around how we work digitally um, and i think this is most read readily noticeable you know online events so people who didn't really engage with ways to collaborate and communicate digitally beforehand are now being forced to because there's no other way they can do their work they, they can't run no, they can't meet people they can't run sessions any other way and even those who were doing so beforehand um, are now finding that they need to be more aware of the challenges and the obstacles that, that arise. They need to know how to do it better. So briefly in this session, we're going to look at, we're going to hear some experiences of running events. We're going to have some breakout groups and give people the chance to talk to one another and share their experiences. We'll probably just have one breakout group. We'll see who else joins in the meantime. We'll talk about the opportunities and challenges online that, that events offer. We're then also going to focus on CBA in particular. Um, we've got Teresa with us, who um, is obviously organized, one of the key organizers last year in the shift to an online event from an in-person event last year. Um, and obviously this year as well was the follow-up. Um, so there's lots of uh, lessons to be learned there. And particularly from, from last year's event to this year's event, how do things change? Um, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, as I say, do put any comments and questions in the chat box. So I just wanted to reference here that there are lots of different types of events that we're talking about. You know, there is the bog standard um, meetings, calls, meetups that where you know, a few of you are just calling to catch up. Um, there are more detailed webinars and seminars where you make presentations, where there is a Q&A question and answer session at the end. There are workshops uh, where you might collaborate using whiteboards and tools that allow you to, to make notes and share notes collaboratively. Everyone sees the same document um, and can do so. 
there's training sessions like this where you can sort of play recordings and that kind of thing. There's speeches, there's film screenings. You can, you can you know, premiere films and videos. Uh, there are conferences such as CBA 15. And then there's sort of discussions and dialogues where there's a high level of interactivity. So there's, there's a whole range of things to consider when you're, when you're looking at online events. And whilst the principles are similar throughout, there are, there are you know, all kinds of tools and all kinds of systems you can use to uh, perform these events and lay on these events and enable people to participate, all have their pros and cons. We're going to hear in a moment from some of the, the researchers at IID who have run these events, organised these events. They've had to switch from in-person to digital with one or more of these examples that I'm giving. And we're going to hear uh, in their words, you know, the sort of the challenges that they came up against and so on. From IID's perspective, I just want to touch on this briefly, that there's, there are many assets that we found from, from running these online events. The most obvious is, obvious is the increase in attendance you can have. A colleague of mine recently wrote a blog about our sort of year-long experience. She's our external events officer. And in the course of that, we, we, we looked at all the data that we had, and we realized that we'd had a 300% increase in attendance. Being able to join at the click of a button means an, a great increase in reach, even taking um, account of the technological challenges that that might pose. Importantly, though, it's not just the reach that online events really um, gives you the opportunity to do. It's um, increase in geographical diversity. So we've had participants from 118 countries join our online events at IIED. And it's also the diversity of speakers. So beforehand, three quarters of our speakers uh, were UK based when we were running in-person events. Now we can get you know, the best people, the best speakers, the most relevant speakers from across the world. So we can have government officials, we can have civil society and community representative, grassroots, grassroots representatives, uh, youth activists from across the globe. And we've registered a doubling in the non-UK speakers that we've been able to have in sessions um, and share their experiences. I don't want this session to be all me talking at all, um, although that's been the case thus far. So I want to get some more voices involved. And I mentioned we've got some of our researchers that, who can share their experiences. Um, and we're going to start with Olivia Wilson-Holt. Um, so she's a researcher in our biodiversity team at IIED. And she ran a series of workshops um, with a select invited group of people around the illegal wildlife trade work around that. Um, so she's going to talk about issues around registering for events in particular and some of the digital tools you can use, including Mentimeter um, and Mural, which is a collaborative whiteboard tool. Here we go. Dillis and I were involved in a series of seven online learning events between September and December last year. And normally sessions have taken place in person, but obviously we weren't able to do that this time. Um, and these particular sessions were designed to take participants through each step of the flood methodology so that they could understand how they might be able to use it in the future where they work. We were contracted by the IUCN East and Southern Africa or ISARO office um, to develop the content for the sessions, handle the registration, provide a platform, which was Zoom in the end, um, conduct the sessions and also support on the m &E. We held these every two weeks um, over a period of three months and each session was two hours long. Um, so because ICN Azaro wanted to capture certain information due to donor requirements. We decided to use Eventbrite um, to ask a preset list of invited participants to register for each of the sessions. We had a few issues at the beginning because the link was forwarded by participants to others who hadn't been invited. Um, and this was a bit of a problem because one of the donors has a strict attendee criteria, meaning everyone had to be vetted in advance. Um, and also because the series was intended for a very specific audience from East African community partner states. Um, so we did end up having to email a few people and ask that they not attend. Um, and going forward, we then ensured that all the event by pages were private, um, so they could only be accessed with a particular link and not found on Google or anything. Um, 
So we had overall 120 different people attend one or more of the seven sessions um, and had about 40 people on average per session. They were quite content heavy. It was a lot of PowerPoint slides, but we did try and make them as interactive as we could by using Mentimeter and Mural. Um, We did think about halfway through of introducing breakout rooms but decided against it in the end because we probably only had out of those 40 people attending, maybe 10 or 15 people who were really engaged and who actually contributed in the sessions. Um, And because different people joined each time, it just, it kind of felt like it wouldn't really work properly. Um, Re Mentimeter and Mural, we struggled to get full participation participation on Mentimeter, um, even in the later sessions when people had used it um, before and when they were more used to it, and we never really figured out why this was. Um, Participants did seem to get to grips um, with Mural a bit more easily, but we did have to spend quite a bit of time the first time we used it to explain how it worked, what to do and what not to do, and because there were so many people on the call and people had quite bad internet problems. Um, I wouldn't say we hugely used it um, probably as effectively as it could have been used. Um, We did do a survey monkey at the end of the series and responses showed that people did like both Mural and Mentimeter, but that because they hadn't used them before, they didn't, you know, they weren't aware of how they worked. Um, So in the future, we probably have to build in some more time to go through them properly so that we could make full use of them. So I guess one of the main reflections we had as a group was that the series would have probably been more effective and interactive with a much smaller audience. So the fact that not everyone joined each session and because some participants, as I said, were so much more engaged than others, um, meant it was hard to develop any sort of kind of connection with um, and between the other participants. We did encourage people to post in the chat uh, and to ask questions but I think we could have made more space for sharing experiences and sharing knowledge um, with a smaller group. And this was reflected also in the Survey Monkey responses because participants kind of, when they were asked about what they would change, um, they really liked the sessions, but again, they wanted them to be more interactive and possibly with some more kind of practical elements like giving a presentation or, or something like that. Okay, so that was Liv uh, with the first uh, example of her sessions. <clears throat> a couple of key points to pick up there, I think, was she she was describing the tools that were being used. You know, I think that reinforces what I was saying earlier in terms of um, how you know you need to explain the tools. You have to sp- you have to spend quite a lot of time on those tools early on um, in order um, to, to to get the value um, in the session. Um, and also I want to talk a bit about accessibility at this stage before before we go, go on to the next person. So these clips that, that I'm showing you are excerpts from a l- sort of internal learning and sharing event that we ran at IAID where we wanted uh, our staff to learn from the experiences of other staff. Um, Teresa was among those who, who contributed to that session. Um, what we did was we recorded that session, which means now we have the ability to, to repurpose elements um, for events such as these, uh, which wouldn't be as easy to do at an in-person event. Um, And you'll see that we've also taken the time to add subtitles uh, to the text. Um, This is really important because people absorb things, information in different ways, Um, regardless of language difficulties, you know, people are different. Some people like hearing information, some like seeing information, um, some people like seeing it visually and, and can comprehend it better that way. Um, so you really want to make try to make your information um, available in a variety of ways to suit your audience. Um, also, because the, se- the session was recorded, um, they didn't have to be here. We didn't have to um, ask them to attend this in order to share their share the lessons that, that, that they had. Uh, and we don't have to worry about connection issues um, with them and, and doing the testing beforehand. Um, and also, we can um, we can make these videos available for others, uh, for everyone to watch again afterwards. Um, and so, we, you know, throughout this, we'll be um, adding links in the chat box where you can do exactly that. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one now, uh, who is um, another researcher in our, in our natural resources group, um, Christina Swiderska. 
um, who held a very ambitious series of workshops. And before I show her, um, I'm going to share an example of what that ambition actually looks at. So in this short excerpt, um, we're going to see uh, a live stream, live streamed workshop that took place from the side of a mountain in Peru. Uh, there is also a translation, so there's English translation over the, the speaker. And how those changes in the landscapes um, uh, are, are having are moving. Um, so um, the collaboration with scientists and doing this research allow us to um, uh, respond to a specific um, uh, problems that we have. So uh, it could be it could it could be um, pests. It could be. So I just want to give you a very short, um, short excerpt of that, um, but hopefully you can see that see the fact that it, it is on the side of the mountain, um, and that will um, tee up um, Christina's short presentation. This was um, meant to be a two day workshop, and we've split it up into four webinars over four days. And uh, with this workshop, um, two key objectives were. Um, developing new interdisciplinary research. So networking, partnership building were a key objective, including you know, between different sectors and between different actors. And another key objective was meaningfully engaging indigenous peoples in that process. Making this a virtual event was quite, a virtual workshop was challenging given those objectives, but actually, you know, when we got down to thinking about it and planning it, we saw that there was real opportunity provided by going virtual. Um, I mean, we had a small budget, just enough for like 30 people, uh, but we ended up having um, more than 130 participants, even though we tried to keep it small. And critically, we had many more indigenous people involved and presenting than we could have done um, you know, with the budget that we had. We had uh, 28 indigenous participants rather than five. And they came from you know, different regions, Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Arctic. So we were able to, to completely redesign the event and make indigenous speakers the main focus and the main speakers for the whole event. Um, and I think that was quite a powerful um, thing, way to do it. I think, you know, we were recognizing indigenous peoples as experts. They were sharing knowledge with academics, with UN agencies, with others. So it was kind of trying to change the, the usual format where they're listening to others who are considered the experts. We kept each of them um, at the same time each day. So um, starting at 11, for two or three hours uh, because of the time difference between Peru and China. And um, some of the, a few of the presentations were pre-recorded because of the time difference. Um, so going virtual um, enabled this interaction that we just saw with the communities in the Potato Park. And actually, you know, we were really lucky to have this partner in Peru, Alejandro Agumedo, who's a real technical wizard. Um, and, you know, he set up all the equipment and we were, we were able to give him our, some of our travel budget, about 6,000 US dollars to buy, you know, good equipment. Um, and um, he worked with the communities to develop the script and different actors in the communities presented. They started with a ceremony to the mountain gods and you could see in some of the shots, you could see the mountains really well when they were focusing on the landscape. And so you really felt that you were part of this ceremony, you were in the community, and then they were explaining their, their beliefs and their values and how that relates to their food system. And I think it was a real eye-opener eye for a lot of the academics. We had more than 50 academics from UK universities, from Kew Gardens. And I think it was probably the first time they had acknowledged that indigenous peoples you know, are experts, that, that, that they have tremendous knowledge and tremendous values that are really important. So that was Christina. A couple of things that that pulled out um, was really sort of 
how you can reshape and redesign events to give them a different focus. So in, in this instance, to really highlight, highlight the expertise of indigenous peoples. Um, and she also talked about the equipment needed. So the equipment side of things can often be daunting. Um, so it's, it's worth sort of pointing out that we also held a sort of separate sessions with, with Alejandro um, and, and other sort of um, indigenous communities in China and in Kenya, where we shared all those lessons that, that we'd learned from running that first event in Peru um, and could, you know, and, and helped um, uh, the, the, the other communities to be able to do similar um, and, and share that, that, that knowledge and that experience. Finally, we're going to um, talk about language, which is uh, another key element of online events. Um, so Zoom itself offers lots of translation functions. And now we're going to hear from IID Chief Economist Paul Steele, um, who's going to talk about language and his experiences there. So, yeah, on the issue of translation, which is uh, both a challenge and an opportunity in using uh, remote platforms. I just want to give three examples of what I've been using along with others. The first and most uh, basic one is you literally just have someone in the call who speaks more than one language. So if you have a small call with about 10 people where we've had English and French speakers or Portuguese and English and French speakers, we've just had one person translating. I mean, that's relatively easy because it costs nothing it's it's immediate it, it's you know you can ask questions if people haven't understood but it's um it's a bit clunky and slows things down the, the high-end option is to have uh, the full works where you pay for a simultaneous translation so you have different channels on your zoom program if you're using zoom uh, and I've been involved in a, a sort of peer learning exchange with about 75 people where we had a French channel, an English channel and a Portuguese channel. That worked well. I mean, there were one or two technical hitches, but nothing significant. It's good. One of the lessons learned is not to, to make sure that all the speakers in the plenaries don't speak English and then have translation. It's only fair if some of your main speakers speak French or Portuguese, let's say, and are then translated into English. So you need to think about when you develop your, your speakers that you have a, a, a multilingual set of speakers. Um, and then the final example I want to talk about is where we had a kind of hybrid, where we had a workshop in Bangkok for Thai speakers and we wanted them to not have to wear, uh, have their computers and headphones on. So we had just the, but we need to understand the Thai and, uh, and our presentation needed to be translated into Thai. So basically we had the translators in the room in Bangkok with all the Thai speakers and the translators had a headset on and would listen to us speaking in English and then translate into Thai. And when the Thai speakers spoke Thai, they would speak back to us in English. Uh, I mean, that worked relatively well. It meant, however, that we, uh, that we couldn't get much of a sense of the meeting because you obviously don't see all the speakers, you just see the translators from our side. But in terms of avoiding the need for, for the bulk of your audience to have equipment it makes it much more straightforward for them so those are the three uh, options we've used for translation and all of them basically have pros and cons thanks so that's the final one from paul Steele, um talking about language um obviously um you know having online events off offers lots of opportunities for language um, it's also one of the more, more challenging aspects to address um as as he was going through the pros and cons um, thanks, Ashmita. I've uh, seen the comments that uh, you, you love this idea of recording and adding subtitles. Yes, it is, it is really effective um, and it's something that um, immediately sort of takes, takes it up another level um, in terms of comprehension and being able to, um, to reuse things and make, make the most out of your resources. That's enough from hearing from us, I think.
um, keen to hear from all of you and um, speak in a little bit more depth. Um, so we're going to go into, I think, just one breakout room. So we're going to um, ask two key questions in these breakout groups. Um, and this is really, you know, we want to hear from you. Um, so um, the two questions are what, are, what are the biggest benefits of online events? Um, and um, what are the greatest challenges? Um, so we just wanted to feed back briefly from the two sessions. Teresa, do you want to go first? Too many windows as always. That's yes. the problem with, with, <laughs> with online. I just by mistake, I think, opened five extra windows. Um, I think it was a, a, a lot of, I think it resonates what we know, what, what we've been talking about and what people brought up. Uh, the main thing I think that everyone kind of agreed on is this farther reach, uh, the outreach in terms of the participants and also the speakers and how that increases that the quality uh, of the content and of the discussion, being able to include so many more, um, so many more people. Um, but obviously also in terms of uh, the quality, how many other people are shut out um, because of the tech. Uh, and how many people we lose uh, an opportunity to have in. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's much easier to participate when you're invited, you get on an airplane. It's much more costly and everything, but when you're there physically in person, even language barrier and the human, you know, it's, um, so I think the, the double-edged sword of uh, wider outreach, more diversity, more geographical spread, uh, uh, further, more you know, different ideas, but at the same time, also the the difficulties with the tech. Um, I really liked um, the people saying that just in fact that, considering especially lockdown, that we're able to connect. Uh, Constance said, "Here we are. We're able to laugh and talk together. Like how how amazing is that? That we're all locked down in our own homes, but we're still able to still chat and catch up." Um, and um, yeah, I think tech and everything kind of is, is the, the, the participation and the being able to go. Um, Ashmita brought up this thing about, and I think it goes to what you were saying also in a way, Matt, about people take information in different ways and learn different ways and be online having the recordings. For her, she was like, that's been like a huge benefit. You just absorb in a different way if you're able to go back to it and how amazing of a resource that is. Uh, and I think lots, everyone that's gone online has tried to now we're building these databases and libraries of resources, online resources that you can just kind of take at your own pace. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few more things that I'll write down after, but those were a bit of the, the, the highlights that come to mind. Excellent. Thanks very much. We, we touched on some of those things as well. Um, um, just a couple of things to add, I suppose, is that um, I, you know, we, I think we, we really focused on the interaction and, and the engagement um, and that, you know, you can't simply just move um, plan what you might have planned for an, for an in-person event online. Uh, it just doesn't work the same the same way. And the interaction is key. Um, you know, you can you can tell when the effort has been put in was uh, was a key comment. Um, and also that, you know, the, the, these tools that we that we use and we are using now, whether it's breakout groups or polls or so on, um, you know, these things are what we do to be interactive and engaging. But, you know, there, there is there is a threshold by way by which they they themselves become fatiguing. Um, you know, if, if every CBA session has a breakout group, then at some point you're going to get bored of a breakout group um sometimes you just want to sit and listen <laughs> yes exactly yes so um so so you know that th there can't be an assumption that just because we think these things are engaging and interactive that that that's how the audience takes them i think is, is, is a key thing um we talked about you know the the greater options that are available in terms of you know now you can join anything all over the world and you can invite people um to attend who you, you wouldn't necessarily have invited or they wouldn't have considered coming to an in-person event, whereas they might, you know, if, if it's online um, and, the, and the opportunities that gives. I think Dan, it, it was who said, you know, this was all possible before, but, but now it's actually happening. Um, and um, uh, we, we can, you know, we're benefiting from that. Um, Annette pointed out that 
a lot is Eurocentric. Um, so e e even with CBA, we, we use CBA as an example. Uh, she's based in Australia. And even though we've, we've worked hard at CBA to have sort of three different time slots so as many people as possible can, can engage, uh, the earliest session for her is five o'clock in the, in the evening, um, which is obviously sort of after working hours. So it's, it's more difficult um, for, it's, st it's still, even if you put time and effort into that, you know, it still might not suit everybody. Um, we talked about the power imbalances that um, can both be um, more, um, more important. Uh, so sort of dominant people can be more dominant um, and also how it's also um, sometimes easier for people who are less confident to be able to contribute, whether it's by chat box or, or, or things like that. Um, and, you know, how it's harder to know really who is in the room. Um, so, you know, it's about re building relationships. We touched on relationships quite a lot um, in terms of we I, th I think Dan, it was who said, you know, he's made more connections than ever over the past sort of 12 months. Um, but maybe not as meaningful. And there's, there's another step to be able to sort of make those connections into sort of trusting, uh, strong uh, relationships. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a bit from us. Um, and we can uh, cover anything that has been left out um, in the Q&A at the end, I think. Um, so we've mentioned CBA a little bit there. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have Teresa here, who's sort of one of the key people who's been organising um, the event for many years and sort of has led on the switch from the, the in-person event to the online event last year and continuing it this year. Um, so we thought we'd do a little bit of a more in-depth focus just on CBA and get uh, a bit meta about it all in this session. Uh, Teresa. I think that's a good way of putting it and thought about the, the meta level of, of all of this. Um, yeah, so I think I think one thing that we wanted, I'm, I'm going to try to, because again, the, the levels of awareness around this, it seems like everyone is pretty, has really good experiences and has been thinking really uh, deeply about the, you know, going online and not. So I'll try to just go really quickly over the points and then maybe we can revisit if someone wants to understand more what I was referring to or follow up on a certain point so we open up the, the floor. Um, I think the, the main thing that for us to point out is uh, when thinking about CBA and for us and the lessons and what we'll take forward is the scale of CBA in that it's multiple things happening at exactly the same time. <laughs> and there's the sessions happening at the same time, but there's also opportunities. And again, this goes with touch on this, um, Matt, the point that we really want it to be interactive and we want people to engage in different ways and people think in different ways and people are interact in different ways, feel more comfortable in some spaces or others. So we're really trying to attempt to find a different thing for different people. But that also means there's quite a lot. It's not just having like one webinar or one meeting at a time. Um, so that brings in a whole other different pros and cons and different things that we need to consider uh, in terms of, of, of the scale um, and the, the diversity of elements that we're trying to do to try to kind of keep it interactive. But again, I, I guess there's also that element for some people it's like, you know, might be too much. I think another big thing for, um, for us with CBA is that we've always prided ourselves in the in-person CBA about that kind of interaction and the networking and people really always go back to CBA because they really loved the, the, the energy and the vibe and the, the spirit and the informality and people getting to know each other and interacting. And that's been the thing that we've all missed the most and really wanted to bring in. So again, for us, the big emphasis on the interaction and being able, for example, to have, so uh, one of the big lessons for us is how do we balance between um, having it open and having accessible and being able to have all these, you know, you don't, you don't have the walls of a room limiting you in number, but we do want people to interact. And if you have a session of 200 people, you don't really get 
any interaction opportunity. Um, so we've been really kind of struggling with that. And I think it's all of these questions, there's no right answer. It's just these questions where, again, for us, you just have to go back to think, what is our top priority? What is our top objective? And recognizing that your top priority and objective of a certain meeting in person might be different and you might have to reconsider. Um, when we were expecting to meet in person, this is what the top purpose and the top things that we wanted to get out of it. But now going virtual, our top priorities might have to shift uh, and you have to kind of think about designing that based on your priority. Is it just, you just want everyone to be in the room and see each other and get to like, you know, it's, it's your team and you haven't had a chance to, and you just want to then play games because you just want people to interact and get to like feel familiar with each other, or is it a knowledge sharing? And you just want to make a presentation. So you want to put the money behind a good recording, a good translation, and people to be able to take it home. So that that kind of kind of revisiting the 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 objectives there, um, which I think was a big thing for us going from an in-person CBA to online. Um, another top point is the communications. Uh, and again, uh, what Matt mentioned earlier, people absorb information in very different ways. And something that we have found really difficult is trying to get to the communication to such a variety, uh, a variety of people. Um, you really have to like communicate, communicate, clarify as much as possible, as much as possible really have very clear, like, this is how you do this, this is how you do that. And also be prepared for people don't read their emails. I think we've all been there where we get the emails with all the instructions and we say, I'll deal with it later. And then you show up on the day and actually it's all right there. But, you know, last minute you're like, where's this, where's that? How do I find this? And it's, so that that's always a struggle as an organizer. Um, I think you still have to make all that information available, but you have to be prepared for people are still going to ask you everything all the way to the last minute. Um, but communications um, is, is really important and making clear, making your messages clear and then just repeating them and putting them here and putting them there and putting them in different, in different ways and maybe even having them written by somebody else. Because if I write the message on how to do something, I'm always gonna write it in the same way. So having somebody else that thinks a bit differently and thinks of instructions in a different way. Um, the fact that going online is just as much, uh, just as much effort as something in person and more um, possibly even more costly. I think a lot of people, I think everyone by now has probably gotten used to it, but last year, a lot of people were like, oh, it's online. It's it's easy, it's free, it doesn't cost anything. We're not, we're not hiring a venue, we're not buying food for everyone. But actually when planning, be prepared that you're gonna need a lot, a lot of staff time. Um, and that's not always, uh, that's not very, very cheap. Everybody's time is really valuable. Uh, and don't underestimate how much time and how many people it requires and I think all of us have learned how running one zoom meeting you need more than one or two people um so I think it's it's people underestimating and and getting us to explain to the donors because all of us are in the same sector um get that's been one of the challenges also to be able to explain to the sources of money actually this this takes a lot of work and a lot of time uh, even though we save cost savings on other ends and on carbon and travel, we're kind of having to spend a lot of time uh, in, in just managing everything. Um, as much as um, you can, if you're really in touch with your, and I think in this, in this group of people, in this community, your audience, listening to the audience when you are planning, listening to what they're looking for and what they're expecting, before we went, we did the transition to go virtual. We sent out a survey to all the CBA mailing list and we have a really amazing uh, community formed by <laughs> a lot of you who are very responsive and everyone responded to let us know 
what they were expecting, what they would want. If we went virtual, what would be like kind of the top priorities? So keeping that communication to again, touch base uh, on where are we going? Cause you don't have that like direct interaction with people that you can sense where people are at. Um, and I think Olivia also talked about this um, when they started getting feedback from the experiences, they realized uh, how they would change things um, to the next one. Um, and then again, I think by now, this idea of testing, really, it relates to the communications, it relates to like, make sure everything's really clear and test everything, try everything beforehand, um, do yourself like go through the process before it goes live, imagine yourself having to go ask friends, hey, can you go try this? Can you make sure this Google Doc actually works? Um, it's, there's, yeah, it requires a lot, a lot of testing. I think a main thing, um, again, it, we're becoming the new normal, but um, before we were all so used to in-person events, we all were really good at improvising because our level of basic knowledge was already, we could manage a room, we could facilitate, we could say, I have to do a session, great, let's do. But now um, it doesn't mean the same skills that we all had for in-person don't just easily translate to an online context. You have to revisit and you have to realize, okay, maybe the same things that I used to improvise in person don't actually apply. So it really does um, kind of, I think for the ego, it has been, an interesting process for a lot of people that felt like expert facilitators and organizers and all of a sudden then realizing, oh, oh wait, actually. So I think, um, yeah, that's been a, a, an interesting process for all of us organizers as well and uh, facilitators. Um, I, yes, I mean, just to pick up on your point on testing, I, I cannot be emphasized enough. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are so many things that can go wrong and do go wrong. Um, if you're not fully prepared, um, then then there's really no <laughs> there's really no excuse. You've got you've got to sort of you've got to take out anything. Um, you've got to get everything in line as much as possible so you can deal with all those unexpected um, events um, and make sure you're ready for those. Yeah, and even if you are fully prepared, things will happen. Mm, so mm. imagine if you're not fully prepared. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. You have to you have to assume something will always happen, um, which is why the fully prepared part is even more yes more I mean yeah I, as, a, as a quick glimpse behind the scenes um perhaps we could give some insight into the opening session of CBA uh where our our main moderator um who was um IID's Claire Shakya um was was violently ill um on the morning of um of the uh of the event and actually sort of only joined us a minute before we were due to start um, and she was sort of in charge of moderating the entire session so there was a lot of panicked okay who who, who stands in what are we going to do and so on so you know you can only do that if everything else is is mapped out and you know what's happening you can only deal with those sorts of things um so yes right so we're going to go into um a brief uh q a now um so do do um, ask questions uh, type in the chat box or um, raise your hand and we'll and, and speak. Um, I can go back to Dan's question uh, from a while ago to, to kick things off. Um, so Dan asked about subtitling um, and whether this was sort of in response to the videos that we showed um, earlier on and um, whether it was something we were doing internally or, or engaging specialists. Um, it's largely internally is the answer. Um, we, we do have a couple of tricks that we use. Um, we separately we we produce pot we've got a new podcast uh, called make change happen um which sort of looks at uh, lots of things and then we 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 get those fully transcribed and we do actually employ a specialist to do those um and we would do for really key long pieces of text i imagine but for shorter videos um we do them ourselves basically um a tip in case you're unaware of this is um, you can upload a video to YouTube and it will automatically generate um, captions that are sort of 70 to 80 percent accurate. Um, so uh, a quick way of doing it is to do that, even if you're not going to actually put the video on YouTube, to, to put it into YouTube, generate the captions that way, tidy them up in YouTube 
and then download them and use them um, elsewhere um, as you want. Um, I mean, even that though, there, there, there is a challenge. So, you know, it's a great service, but um, as we've ex seen over the last couple of years, um, you know, um, tech companies um, have algorithms that are biased towards white global north voices um, and so on. So YouTube easily recognizes my voice um, uh, and so on. It has a lot of difficulty with others. Um, so in those instances, we have to uh, do those manually. Um, we tend, as I say, we tend, if it's sort of up to four or five minutes, we'll, we'll do it. Um, but it's a huge resource drain. You know, you, you just simply can't do it for everything. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, I wanted to um, mention a contribution from Alinda, who's who's in the meeting, but isn't um, uh, English isn't her natural uh, language. So she's been using a sort of translator to, con to contribute in text. Uh, so she didn't join one of the breakout groups, but she wanted to mention that um, during the pandemic, it was uh, the online events were really useful to continue to actually continue the work as a civil society organization and to communicate with donors. Um, she felt that using these online platforms actually brought their organization and them closer to the donors and international partners because mm. they didn't need to wait sort of, you know, a year to have monitoring and partner meetings uh, and so on. So, so that they, they found that that was really useful in order to be able to approach donors and partners outside Mozambique, where she's based. Um, the biggest challenge um, as an organization which works with the rural community in particular has been, you know, using these platforms to use to, to work with those communities. So this is, you know, the digital divide and technology issues. Um, we know they have no control over the use of technologies um, and when they carry out online events, they feel that they are totally excluding those communities who are actually their target group. Um, so that's a really key thing. Um, she also mentions the issue of language, um, how their events have been in Portuguese, uh, the community speaks the local language. Um, and many times when they actually get the technology, then they still can't um, engage because uh, you, it's difficult to get in somewhere in the Portuguese language and the local language at the same time. Um, so that's some of the, 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 uh, the challenges. Um, Maybe Teresa, I'll, anything I to can, add to that? No, I was going to um, answer to Dan's second question. Uh, if we just take it in turns, um, Dan asked, um, would you then, I think it was in, in reference to the chair of a session go, being sick last minute and potentially not showing up, Zed, would you then recommend to have a backup moderator in case of the opening session? Um, yeah, I think this goes to the, 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 the planning of the session. So because of this thing that sessions, actually online sessions take quite a big group, um, what we've been really kind of for the CBA sessions, um, all the, we have a bunch of material and templates that the session organizer has to fulfill, has to fill in. And that has all the different people that they're working with and their contact info, then doing a test run, which is them actually meeting beforehand and planning between I'll be chairing, you'll be speaking, then there'll be the other speaker, then so-and-so will do this in that process everyone gets to know the plan so that you do have in a way a built-in somewhat backup. Because I think getting a backup plan B for every person that might fail at some point, um, I think like I see you nodding would be pretty difficult. Um, obviously, if you're in a VIP level, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that is possible and that should happen. But I think it's this thing of if you have a team and this is why we are, I don't know if anyone's been involved in any of the session organizers. I know Sakib has. Um, we've been really like harassing and harassing the session host to like really get these documents filled out and meet and have a test run to test the technology and also discuss because if someone goes, then someone can step in and knows more or less um, who, who are the people in the room, what the introductions were gonna be, what the plan was, so yeah. That's a, a, a great, um, yeah, another really obvious reason of why to have these test runs. Uh, comment from Saqib uh, <clears throat> from ICAD. Hi, Saqib, hope you're well. Um, I haven't seen you for a bit. Um, 
the um, he points out that um, many tech companies don't have local servers in developed countries, which is obviously a good point. Um, so, you know, some, some of the um, applications, um, digital platforms that um, they've been invited to contribute to or join, um, you know, just don't work in the same way um, in the global south. Um, so keeps based in Bang Bangladesh. Um, yeah, th this is absolutely right. Um, we, we recently did some... Um, uh, a big study of sort of digital working um, here at IIED that I was involved with. And part of that involved talking to, to a lot of our partners, um, particularly those in the global South. And one thing that about, about all these kinds of issues, and one thing that really came out strongly from, from that was that the organizations didn't feel um, they were ever properly asked what worked best for them. Um, you know, th this is the, the power dynamic that global North organizations, um, whether, uh, you know, NGOs, charities or um, donors and, and those kinds of things are, are um, you know, forcing um, partner organizations, less powerful partner organizations to comply with what they want to do rather than asking them, you know, what works for you, what's easiest for you, how you know, how can you have control of the data that's generated as part of this? Um, uh, so, you know, we, we're, we're sort of working on um, looking at sort of increasingly open source tools. Um, so so to, to allow um, organizations to have that, that greater control over the data and the systems. But then open source often does mean, you know, a little bit more technical know-how, more resources involved. Um, and that kind of thing. So there, there's, there's really stuff to balance all the time. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you're not even asking these organizations, you know, these key partners of the, what, what their preferences are, then, you know, you need to sort of address that, I would suggest. Um, message from Amy. Um, Teresa, do you want to answer what the future of events looks like well, post-pandemic? <laughs> I was thinking it was a question to the participants. Yes. And I think that's a great question. We have lots of thoughts <laughs> that might not be that. We're, um, but yeah, uh, I, we, this is actually, we really, really want to know this as CBA organizers. Um, the future, uh, just for the recording, what does the future of, of events look like post-pandemic? Um, Dan, Dan, I saw you put a question, so maybe I'll pick on you to, to answer that, and then hopefully others will join the floor. Oh, that's a hard question, to be honest. Uh, I was just thinking, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I can imagine that, um, so at my, my organization, we just have a new office, and uh, we are thinking about placing some video screens in the meeting rooms, so some people can work from home, join the meetings, and so I was saying maybe some hybrid style events where you invite some of the participants uh, live and some of them uh, online. I don't know. And, and I also think that requires some extra uh, uh, thorough thinking because like you said, Teresa, um, uh, online meeting is not the same as an, uh, a real life meeting, but then a hybrid meeting will probably also be a bit, uh, well, that will, will include some more challenges. So maybe, maybe in, in that kind of, um, way I, I don't know I don't have the answer for you sorry no no it's a it's an open open conversation Amy is actually uh, our expert resident is the the event organizer of CBA and previous CBAs so Amy you've had a lot of learning of having to pick up a lot of set of new skills as you have gone from like in person to virtual and I think you've already started probably working on kind of the hybrid or at least thinking about that, I'm sure. Um, Absolutely, and... yeah, yes, indeed. I've actually run a couple of hybrid meetings last year. Um, and Dan, I think you're absolutely right. There's definitely a, a, a completely new set of skills that you need there and you need to kind of understand the physical um, things that are needed as well as the online and technical. So you really have to kind of marry those two together. But I think it can work if it's done well. Has anyone in this group attended or been to a, a, a hybrid event? The key, the key is also about what we mean by hybrid in terms of, um, you know, so you, know, you, can, you can run an event and you can live stream it from a camera at the back of the room and so on. But is that really hybrid? Um, you know, 
what what chances are the people who aren't there have to engage? You know, but in in my experience, those types of things are just dominated by whoever's in the room, um, and so on. So it, it it's about it's about the level of interaction and engagement that you can offer, and between those in the room and those who are who are outside. Um, hybrid is the most is the most difficult aspect of, of it all um i think that's certainly what we're we're experiencing um there's one principle yeah. that that i've seen um that um going to going on what dan was saying um in terms of you know the sort of video screen up in a room and you have people in the room and then people don't know and that is that sort of approaching it from the idea that if one person is remote everyone is remote um because the dynamics are such that if there are four people in the room um, and one person, you know, on a call or whatever, those four people can have individual conversations amongst themselves and exclude that person. Um, so it, it, it's sort of addressing it, you know, that get, getting that mindset right, I think. What does everyone else think? <laughs> Just to comment on that, Matt, I, I think that that's Totally, I agree with that because I've been the the virtual participant in a hybrid event, not the physical one myself. But again, from the group of us that were attending virtually, uh, it just felt like you know, in a plenary when they're having a big sort of uh, discussion, there's a few speakers sitting on a stage. Then it kind of works because you know you can maybe set up the screen so that each speaker gets a little bit of time, and it's also on the screen there live as well as on the screen for us in Zoom. But when they're doing the breakouts, when they're doing the sort of roundtables, it where we're just watching and there's very little interaction that, you know, even if there's a facilitator, they're so, um, I'd say for lack of a better word, consumed with the people in the roundtables that they kind of forget that there are virtual people sitting on a laptop right next to his screen. So he's, you know, working with, with people with flip charts and post-its and just every now and then forgets to sort of check the chat box. So it does seem like we're sort of observing, you know, if, if that was the sort of role that we had, it worked out fine. But in terms of being an engaging workshop participant, it, it's really, really difficult. And I think that's that's kind of one of the mindsets that people need to sort of, again, pick up skills on. If you're, if you're going to be doing that um, sort of uh, hybrid event, as a facilitator, that's something that it, I think quite a lot of people will be needing to be skilled up on. And uh, I think the principle of sort of, if there's even a few people that are virtual, then everybody should be treated uh, virtually. I think that works out. And again, I've heard of um, events where even though people are there physically, they're encouraged to maybe join in on a chat on their phone so that everybody can put their comments up. It's not only about people who can raise their hand and they get a microphone and they get to say something. Everybody's treated the same. You all put the mm -hmm. comments in the chat box and the facilitator treats even a virtual participant writing in the chat box as well as someone physically in the room. So maybe maybe just sort of expanding that kind of um, facilities to everybody. That, that might be something that we have to build up on. Absolutely, Sakeep. Yeah, I, I completely agree in terms of the, the you know, have separate, having separate conversations going on. And then as, as Teresa was saying, you know, the, the facilitator's got to be skilled enough or, or there's got to be enough resources there to be able to monitor, you know, the different things happening in, in different places and, and bring it all together. Um, we're coming to the end now. Um, so um, I think that is uh, all we have time for. Uh, I wanted to say one really final point that, that hasn't been raised, but is a, is a sort of little burning issue of mine. And it's sort of come up a couple of times when people have talked about uh, less travel or, you know, sort of repurposing travel budgets um, and, you know, saving on carbon emissions. Um, I like to highlight that, you know, just of, of course, flights and so on is, is a massive uh, producer of carbon emissions, but digital working isn't carbon neutral. Um, oh, yeah. So there, 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 is, there is a, you know, the, 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 the data that is being generated, the video calls um, and so on, that that is a big um, uh, emitter of carbon and carbon is being generated. Um, so it is something to bear in mind, sort of be wary of saying, oh, yes, you know, we've we've got rid of all travel and we've gone digital. So so uh, that is um, that that's it. We're sorted, um, as it were. Um, but yeah, so on that final point, I'd really want to thank you for your time, uh, for your questions, your comments and um, all the sharing experience, your generosity there. Um, that's been really great. Um, Thanks uh, also to Teresa, uh, who helped. Thanks, Matt. Um, and yes, Pippa, do um, do um, get in touch separately. That We'd, we'd welcome that. Um, one final thing is in the bottom right of, your, of the chat box, there are three dots. 
Um, so you feel free to um, click on that and then you can save the chat. So the resources um, that we've been putting in the chat box throughout the session, you can save and look at at a later date, should you wish. Um, Dan, um, yes, we can certainly look at how to um, to 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 make the hybrid meetings engaging for rope participants next year. We'll have even more lessons um, and so on. Um, we were going to finish with a with a final poll, but in the interest of time, um, we're going to forego that. Um, it is very good practice to finish with a survey um, and so on, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of that at CBA uh, in in this conference. Uh, good, so that's good, it. good moment to plug in. Please fill out the CBA yeah. survey at the end of the conference. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yes, you know we we we're my, always my to... organizer hat is always on. <laughs> we're always looking to uh, improve things, um, and we can only do that if we know what you think. Um, so yes, uh, keep an eye out for that. That will be in the sort of follow up emails that get sent out. Um, and thanks so much for your time. Uh, see you soon.